Hey, yo, ho, ho, this is O'Culture. I am Ryan Peverly. What I have here for you is a deleted scene, a stocking stuffer, if you will, from my recent conversation with Linda Radish, author of The Old Magic of Christmas. If you haven't yet heard my conversation with Linda, I don't think it's necessary to listen to it for context, but of course, if you feel inclined to do so, it's episode number 9, titled The Old Magic of Christmas. Either way, this is a neat holiday treat for those interested in not only that old magic of Christmas, but also those of you who may want to get to know me a little bit better. I had quite the paranormal experience one Christmas Eve many, many moons ago in my youth, and Linda is the first person I've told this story to outside of my inner circle. And I did so because I thought she would be able to provide some context at least to what I witnessed. So here that story is now for your listening pleasure. Grab yourself a spiked eggnog and enjoy. Can I tell you a Christmas Eve experience that I had when I was five or six years old? Yes, please do. Okay, so I was in bed on Christmas Eve, and I woke up in the middle of the night, and my parents were asleep, my sister was asleep. I was sleeping with the bedroom door closed. That's very key here. So I opened the door, and I walked out into the hallway, and my bedroom was at the top of a stairwell. Like So when I walked out of my room, I was essentially like at the top of the stairwell, and I could look down into a sitting room that we had at the main level of our house. And at this point, we had the tree in that room. Our Christmas tree was in that room. All the gifts were scattered underneath it, And Linda, I swear to you, there was an elf-like creature standing in front of the tree inspecting the gifts with his hands behind his back, just kind of looking over everything, okay? Mm -hmm. I got scared shitless, Mm -hmm. and I... Sorry, go ahead. What, What did it look like? Do you remember... Well, it looked like what I would call an elf. It was small, all right? So it was not very tall. It had on some sort of hat, and it also looked like it had on sort of a a coat of some sort that was sort of long. I couldn't tell what color it was. It was very dark, obviously. I couldn't tell what kind of pants or anything he had underneath the coat because the coat was kind of long. And I couldn't really see what kind of shoes he wore, so I I don't know. So I got scared, like I said, and I just like went back in my bedroom and shut the door and popped in my bed. This all happened very quickly. And I threw the covers up over my head because I was scared. Yeah. And I laid there for a few minutes. I, I, I was I couldn't go back to sleep, obviously, trying to calm myself down. And I I felt a presence in my room. And I slowly, it's like I was like in a movie almost. Like, you know, somebody will like slowly like pull the covers down over their eyes, you know? So I I slowly pull the cover down over my eyes and that elf-like creature is standing at the foot of my bed looking directly into my eyes. And I throw the covers back up over my head and I just, I just hope and pray that nothing happens. And I don't know how long I laid there. But I eventually fell back asleep and, you know, I didn't see that elf-like creature ever again. Now, I wake up on Christmas Day, you know, the next morning, and I tell my parents and my sister this. And they just dismiss it, you know. They they laugh at me. They're like, you didn't so see an you elf. Told, and you told the story immediately? I told it when I woke up. I, I don't know if I told it immediately when I woke up, but I know that morning I told them that I had seen an elf around the tree and then it appeared in my bedroom because I was scared and I didn't know what to make of it. Uh So with your research and knowledge here, what what could I have possibly encountered? Well, I love the story. story, And the story reminds me very much of when I was probably younger than five. Uh, It was summertime. I was sitting on our living room sofa alone. There was nobody else, I think there was nobody else in the downstairs. Somebody was probably upstairs. And I remember seeing, I was the dining, from the sofa I could look straight into our dining room, 
we had a red and blue, not genuine oriental carpet, but like American-made oriental-style carpet. And I remember seeing a dwarf climb up out of that carpet and exit through the kitchen. And it scared the willies out of me, but I don't think I told anybody for like 20 years. Wow. And that, and that carpet has been stolen. Really? <laughs> stolen out of my sister's apartment, and which causes us some amusement because A, it's not a genuine oriental carpet, and I'm thinking, I hope whoever stole it, I hope that door is going to come climb back <laughs> <laughs> when they're watching. That and, and like one other experience I had about that age, I didn't tell anybody for a long, long time for two reasons. One is that I kind of felt like this is not something that my older sister and my parents could possibly relate to. This is not something that they can, they're not going to have anything to offer here. This is outside their experience that will have nothing to offer. And then as I got older, I didn't say anything because have you found that the telling by telling it, it weakens the memory of it? I'm going to probably say no, because I still oh. see this very vividly in my mind. Hmm. So because that's why I was... I would... Go ahead. It, it's like, you know, before, like, I, I, I wrote about my other experience in um, last year's Witch's Companion, I think. Um, and I had... and I. You know, it's the kind of thing, like, you don't think about it. You know, you don't go several years and don't think about it, and then, oh, you think about it. And, and it would be vivid, and it would have the feeling, you know, that I was, I was there. And, and I was afraid if, like, I wrote about it, I would weaken it. And it has weakened. The more I, I mention it and, and write about it, then I'm, like, referencing the memory of the memory of the memory of the memory mm -hmm. of it actually happening. It's like making a photocopy of a photocopy of a, of a photocopy. But what I will, let's see, I'll leave you with this. And this was the only thing that I was able to come up with to comfort my daughter when she saw that, you know how Amazon, for some stupid reason, you know, you order... You order a stuffed dragon as a Christmas present, and the next time somebody brings up that stuff, looks at, wants to look at that stuffed dragon on your account, it will tell you that you ordered it on November 25th. Right. Yeah. So that was how she learned the truth. Oh, and really? The okay. Dragon, the dragon that she had asked Santa for, I had ordered. You ordered this item on November 25th, <laughs> and I was not able to talk my way out of it. Right. But the only thing I was really able to give her, and I believe this is true because of, you know, what I've seen, what you've seen, and I said, I think sometime way back when, and maybe there was more instances of it, somebody, some child, saw something on Christmas Eve or during the season, and it either so frightened them, or it so dazzled and enchanted them that they wanted to remember it, and they passed the, the story of it, of some magical being appearing in, in or outside their home unexpectedly, startlingly. They wanted to preserve this memory so much that they told it to their children, who told it to their children, who told it to their children, and that's what we have today. And maybe whatever that original experience was, still pops up from time to time. That's what I like to think. Well, I have told... Uh, well, I guess, you know, my parents and my sister know, and I've only told a select other few people about it. Um, you know, like people I've been close to, so... This is the first time, I guess, anybody outside my direct circle will have heard the story. But I will say that the memory is alive because damn near every Christmas I still get teased about it. Like it's, you know, some fanciful narrative that I just constructed when I was five or six years old. But 
I swear by it. Like it happened. It it happened to me, and I just didn't know what what it was. Like, could it have been an elf from one of these stories that you dug up in your book? Could it have been, you know, like I have some Irish Celtic roots in my family? Could it have been a leprechaun of sorts, like a uh, like a guardian? I don't know. Do you have any Nordic ancestry? Oh, you know, not that I know of. Why? Could there be some connection there? Oh uh, well, because often the um, they were they were very place oriented. Like you don't have the nest in Iceland because Iceland is way far away from. You know, they all came mostly from. You know, some were Irish slaves, but most of them came from Norway, and so their their homestead, their ancestral seats, would have been back in Norway. And so the the Nith or Taunton or Elf or Ancestral Ghost would have wanted to stay um, stay on that ground. But they, but there are some some little elves in the Faroe Islands, so maybe they were willing to go that far. So it, it, it's conceivable they they like to either stay in the home. The home was usually inherited by the oldest son in the family, so they may also have been attached to the oldest the line of the the oldest son well that would be me i mean i'm i'm older than my sister yeah. so mm-hmm. and, we, and she didn't believe being younger she didn't no no which is very odd to me was, like they yeah. nobody believed me which i i was i was actually pretty disappointed you know but then in england there's a story of a kind of like poltergeist character that's... Ooh, they, he's causing to- so much trouble they're going to move. The family is moving. They're packing up and moving. And then they realize that the poltergeist is on the, he's on the cart. He's well, going with them. You can't <laughs> leave him behind. We weren't moving, but we do have English roots. That's my dad's side primarily has, has English roots. So, well, um, all I can say is there, yeah. are, there are greater things, Horatio. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yep, absolutely. And I think that's a very precious. That's a very precious thing. That's a you know, even though it scared the willies out of you, that's a special thing. I am very proud of the experience. Now, when I look back on it, you know, as I get older, I'm glad that I had it because it's that's actually the best Christmas present there is. Yeah, it's it's actually helped expand my worldview. I mean. Being a child, having the childlike imagination, which I think is important even as you get older, right? I mean, that's that's what we lose when we grow up is that that sort of imagination. Yeah. We we stop believing in magic, Santa right? Claus, maybe the Santa Claus is is good training because that's the that's the last magical thing that most people are able to believe in, and they most of us believed in it probably longer than a, rationally we should have. So maybe it does help for some of us keep our minds open a little bit. And I think that's why it's so important to carry on, you know, to pass that on to your kids. You know, believe in this as long as you possibly can. And maybe, you know, it'll open you up to other things. All right. There you have it. My Christmas Eve visitor story. What do you guys think? Was I visited by an elf? A leprechaun? A dwarf? Some other magical entity? I still don't know, but I do know it happened, and because of that, I still believe in that old magic of Christmas, and I hope you do too. It's a special, special time of year. That said, I am Ryan Peverly, bidding you all the happiest of holidays. May all your wishes come true, and may all your spirits shine bright. And yes, it is a selfless time of year, but do not forget to love yourself, Think for yourself, question authority, and make some magic of your own this weekend.
Rewind this cassette.